How's everybody doing this morning? Are we awake decently? Great. Good. I'm glad that you are awake, ma'am. You're the only one. Uh, we would love to welcome you to this morning's Redeeming Capitalism Conference. We're really glad that you're here with us this morning. And I think you're in for a treat. Last year, our keynote speaker at our conference was Dr. Ken Barnes. He was so well received and we learned so much. And he kept talking about this new book he was going to write, Redeeming Capitalism, that we said, as soon as it comes out, you got to come back and talk to us about it. So you're really in for a treat. I've had the opportunity to read the book and talk to him a number of times leading up to this conference. And somebody has stuck hmm, a throat lozenge on this music stand. So we're going to use the other music stand. Uh, but we're really, we're really excited to have Ken back, and I think you're just going to really enjoy and benefit a lot from what he has to say and bring out of this uh, a number of great practical things you could put into place. And so we'll also have copies of his book, Redeeming Capitalism, for sale in the back where Elizabeth is uh, at any point today and actually as well as when we uh, end this morning. And you'll also have the opportunity, if you'd like, for Ken to sign your copy of the book as well. Um, I should mention the, the book is, he, we're selling the book for under market value, so for $20.00. You have access to this phenomenal book. We're thrilled to be back at Bon Air Baptist. They hosted us last year, and they do a really great job of accommodating us. So a special thanks to Pastor Tom Stocks, uh, who was hoping to be here with us this morning, but as a pastor's life works, had stuff come up. Uh, Randy Lynn, who's helping us out with tech. Greg Leach, who got us set up. And Lori Blakeney, uh, who did a lot to prepare us. And just, um, I'm going to thank a few more people, but to kind of lay the, lay the landscape, I don't know, of this morning for you. Basically, what's going to happen is, uh, once I'm out of your way, our executive director, Buddy Childress, is going to introduce Ken, and then Ken's going to speak. We're going to do some table discussions. He'll come back and speak a second time. We'll do some more table discussions, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions as Ken is talking, I'd encourage you to jot those down, uh, and then we'll wrap. And again, at, th at that time, you'll have the opportunity to buy books and to talk to Ken further. Out these doors to your left are, are the restrooms if you need those. Obviously, please feel free to keep getting coffee and food and orange juice as we go. So let me just thank a couple people, and then I'll hand it over to Buddy. I want to thank our uh, very generous gold and silver sponsors and friends of Needle's Eye, all of whom made this morning's event possible. So that was great on their behalf. Or excuse me, it was really generous of them to do that on our behalf. Uh, Ken works for Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary up in the Boston area, and uh, so we're really appreciative that they made him available to come and be with us, and the Mockler Center within Gordon-Conwell for Faith and Ethics in the Workplace, we really appreciate them. James Lee, as usual, is our videographer, I don't know where James is, he's in the back, he's awesome, so there will be video of this conference available soon, just like we had last year. So we appreciate James. And I really appreciate the staff of Needle's Eye, my coworkers, because they worked really hard to make this morning possible. Um, yeah. Especially, she may not even be in here, but Catherine Dixon. If you, if you see Catherine, she really worked very hard on all the logistics, and so we appreciate her. And if you're new, if you've never been to a Needle's Eye event, or maybe you have, but you haven't heard Dr. Barnes, we really appreciate you coming and giving a Saturday morning uh, to hear from him. Like I said earlier, I think you're in for a real treat. So I'm going to call Buddy Ford. Buddy is our founder, our president, and our executive director. And as he comes forward, although he's coming forward quite quickly, let me, uh, I should have waited, sorry. In a moment, Buddy will come forward. Uh, if you look at your table in front of you, there's a response card, and we're just going to call your attention back to that card later in the, um, later in the morning if there are different ways that you want to get involved further. And on the back, there's an opportunity for you to jot down comments, but also that might be a good place if you have questions that you want to ask later, you could jot down your questions. And now I'll turn things over to Mr. Buddy Childress. Thanks, man. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, actually, I was bringing the card up, so you saved me one announcement. Uh, did you leave a lozenge over here on this one as well? No? So, um, I want to thank you all for coming as well. You know, last year we had this conference. Uh, I had a conference with Ken here, as Jordan mentioned. And as we finished it, uh, so many people said, this was great. Wish the book was ready. I'm coming back, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Ken, it's great to have you here. It's not time quite yet for you to come forward, but we really appreciate you being back with us and coming back to Richmond within 14 months. Uh, no, within 10 months, as a matter of fact. So couple of things about Ken Barnes. Um, I don't know many people. If you do, please stand when I finish this comment. I don't know many people who have spent close to 30 years 
as a top-level executive with six companies, excuse me, five companies, all of whom were multi-billion dollar corporations and in international business. And then while finishing his last five years, uh, became multivocational and went to school and picked up three masters and a doctorate. If anyone knows someone like that, Doug Rucker, I forgot about you. I absolutely forgot that Rucker had did that. Did that. That's just incredible. Let me ask this. How many of you know Doug Rucker? How many of you are surprised at what just happened? Not a hand, Doug. <laughs> Ken has an incredible background, which, which I think makes his um, ability to address these issues more than viable. Uh, he is the, uh, he's a professor of workplace theology and business ethics at my seminary, Gordon-Conwell, which uh, is in the uh, greater Boston area, and has been there for a number of years and has academic background prior to that. But let me tell you something more about Ken in this book. Um, as I read the book, and my wife's here, and she can verify this, there were several times over the course of a week or so. And by the way, number one, you want the book. And number two, you will not finish it in one day. If you do, either let us know how smart you are or you've missed it all, one of the two. It is a wonderful book, and I'm reading it, um, and I'm talking occasionally. I do this to myself, and I'm, this is incredible. How can he be that? Or how can he know this? Ken has such a command of four major disciplines, history, economics, business, and theology. You will love what you hear, and it will make logical sense, and it gets you to the points of the book, the way he understands those disciplines, which is incredible in my thinking. Um, and finally, before I ask him to come up, I would say this to you, and, I, and with all sincerity. I, uh, I've been here for a number of years on this planet. Um, I hear somebody laughing. Was that you, Doug? My wife? My wife! My wife was laughing. Um, <laughs> thank you, honey. Um, and I have seen in my, this is my hometown, and I love Richmond, and I have seen some tremendous progress over the years, and still there's a lot to be done. What I have seen also, and I think you would most of you, if not all, would agree with this, I have also seen an increased difficulty in our culture with regard to the divisiveness and the incivility which, in my mind, permeate where we live today, and not just here. I honestly believe that the message of redeeming capitalism, Ken Barnes' message, may very well be a significant piece of God's plan to heal that, not just here, but in this country and beyond. That's the main reason among many, including my friendship with Ken and how much I care for him, that we wanted him back. So help me welcome Dr. Ken Barnes. That's your, oh, we got a minute of video.
So if there's a reason why uh, Needle's Eye has been successful, in my opinion, uh, one is they've just been faithful to the mission. Uh, and that is always important. The second is he's involved with the churches. That's also incredibly important. A lot of people in this space sometimes try to go around the churches, but he works with the churches. Uh, and he involves people like yourselves. So I want to start by asking you folks to turn to each other at the tables, introduce yourselves to each other if you don't know each other, and then I have a little assignment for you. Ready? We're going to kick this off by, I want you to see how many things you can list in two minutes that are good about capitalism. So introduce yourselves to each other, and then I want you to have a scribe, take a scribe, and then I want you to write down what's good about capitalism. Thirty more seconds. Thirty more seconds. Okay, pens down, as they say. So Raise your hand if your table came up with more than five. Raise your hand if your table came up with ten. Okay, so we're somewhere between five and ten. Um, who'd like to just give me a couple of the top, top liners from your thing? Small business choices, freedom. Okay. Standard of living. Okay, standard of living, freedom, choice. Who came up with a few others? I'm sorry? Rewards. Rewards work. Yeah, fantastic. Anything else? Individual responsibility. What else? Brings people out of poverty. Better than the alternative. We'll talk about that. Spurs innovation. Exactly. Okay, so we could go on, right? And I do this because I always remind people at the very beginning of one of these things that the title of the book is Redeeming Capitalism, Not Replacing Capitalism. Okay? We're going to unpack capitalism a little bit and we're going to talk about the good of capitalism and we should celebrate the good of capitalism. However, as someone who has been in the boardroom and done business all over the world, is, as Buddy said, I have also seen the bad and the ugly of capitalism. <clears throat> and we cannot ignore the bad and the ugly of capitalism because they have an effect on culture, on the environment, on international relations, on how we treat each other in the community. And one of the things I often hear from people is that, well, the, the bad and the ugly, that's just the price we pay for the good. And I reject that. That's not necessary. We can have good capitalism that works for everybody without giving up the wealth creation possibilities of capitalism. Because the problem with the alternatives, as we'll talk about, is unfortunately they become self-defeating for a lot of reasons, which we'll talk about. So, what is capitalism? If you don't remember anything else I say today, remember this. Capitalism is a subject, not an object. It is a subject, not an object. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that capitalism is not really a thing at all. It does not possess what we theologians call hypostasis. It's a Greek word meaning a kind of personality trait. 
There is no central will or agency driving capitalism. Capitalism is not inevitable. Uh, capitalism evolved over the centuries out of other economic systems. And capitalism is nothing more than the cumulative effect of countless individual and corporate decisions that is done in a lightly regulated, highly monetized free market. That's all capitalism is. In fact, we didn't even come up with the name. Guess who came up with the name? Anyone know? Karl Marx. <laughs> Karl Marx came up with capitalism. But it's a reasonable name. But the observation is very simple. It's all of these things. Without monetization, you don't have capitalism. Without innovation and technology, you don't have capitalism. Without free markets, you don't have capitalism. But traditional capitalism was built on a particular ethic. And that ethic is under attack. So consequently, the capitalism we have is the capitalism we've chosen because every economic decision is a moral choice. If we want to change it, we're going to have to make different choices. And we're going to have to find an ethic that will work in our postmodern, post Christian environment. And that's really what the book is all about. So, this is capitalism. And I'm sure you recognize all of those things. And here's some of the good things uh, that I remind people about. First of all, since the dawn of the capitalist age, wealth globally has grown at twice the rate of population. That's because of capitalism. If there had been no growth beyond just the growth of population, you could say that there has been no growth. It was just subsistence. But because wealth has grown at two times the rate of population, you know that you've created wealth. And this is an important distinction as well. What do we mean by wealth? If I went around and just asked people on the street, what is wealth? Almost all of them would say something along the lines of having money. Wealth and money are not the same thing. Money is a representation of wealth. And wealth is not, as Karl Marx defined it, the accumulation of commodities. Because you can have commodities that actually have no value. Here's a definition of wealth you're not going to hear anywhere else. But I think it's a good one. Wealth is the delta between the amount of labor and resources necessary for subsistence and everything else. That delta is wealth. And the reason why that's important, because as we talk about some of the utopian alternatives, they view wealth as though it were matter. It can neither be created nor destroyed. So distribution is what we're after. That is simply wrong. Wealth can be both created and or destroyed. So we need to create a system that allows wealth to be created. And that's really important. And we've done that very well. Someone mentioned takes people out of poverty. Since 1990, severe poverty globally has been reduced by 72%. I think that's incredible. There's less than a billion people on this planet now that are living on less than $2 a day. It wasn't long ago when 36% of the people on the planet lived on less than $2 a day. So we've made great strides because of capitalism. And by every imaginable material definition, capitalism has brought us longevity, better health care, education, access to health care and education, infrastructure, the arts, the sciences, I could go on and on. According to every material metric, it has brought us good things. So capitalism works. But, as we all know, it doesn't work as well for some as others. And this is 
really the crux of the matter. So here's the bad. The bad is we still have three quarters of a billion people on this planet who do live on less than $2 a day. And the gap between rich and poor is growing exponentially. If I filled this room, there are about 75 people here. If I filled this room with the 75 richest people in the world, the wealth in this room would be greater than 4 billion other people that we share this planet with. Think about that for a minute. 4 billion people. More than half the planet. Now, there will always be inequality in a free market system. The inequality isn't the problem. It's the hyper-concentration of wealth that is the problem. And it's the fact that so much of what we have done in recent years, especially in this economy, is we've created the illusion of wealth because much of our economic activity has been built on debt. We cannot ignore that fact. I'm uh, hosting a, a, a conference next year at Bretton Woods. Many of you are familiar with the Bretton Woods system and the Bretton Woods meeting that established the rules of international trade and monetary policy for after the Second World War. And it's been 75 years next year since that. In 1944, when they originally met, the United States was the world's largest creditor nation. And we possessed three quarters of all the world's monetary gold, and the entire world was on the gold standard. Think about that. Today, we are the world's largest debtor nation. And all the gold in Fort Knox would only pay the interest on our national debt for six months. That's bad. That's bad. It's not a good thing. Okay, we've got trillions, 21 and counting dollars of national debt. And we've got an awful lot of personal debt. I was talking to some folks. One of the reasons why millennials are so discouraged about capitalism, and we're going to talk about that later, is they're coming out of university with fifty dollars and $100,000 in debt, and they're finding themselves working at McDonald's for three years after graduation. Credit card debt, all-time high. Non-mortgage debt and mortgage debt both, all-time highs. So we have to be careful that we aren't only paying attention to our p &L account and not paying attention to our balance sheet. And what I mean by that is this. Since 2008, since the crash, the United States has added $4 trillion to our gross domestic product. $4 trillion. Over that same period of time, however, we added $11 trillion to the national debt and another $4 trillion in debt-laden quantitative easing. Because quantitative easing is also built on debt. So in order to gain $4 trillion on our p &L account, which is what gross domestic product is, we took $14 trillion off our balance sheet. Can you imagine the CEO of a company telling the shareholders, oh, I added $400 million to our p &L account, but I had to take $1.4 billion off the balance sheet. <laughs> that wouldn't be a very happy story. And that is something that has happened. And we also have to accept the fact that there is going to be great pressure on our economic system in the coming years because of changing demographics. People are getting older. They are living longer. They require more care. Their pension systems are under tremendous stress. This is private pensions as well as Social Security. So what's going to happen? We're going to have to, as a country, pay for this stuff somehow. So either we're going to have to raise taxes or we're going to have to take on more debt, neither of which are politically popular. But the good news is we have this phenomenal engine for the creation of wealth. So how do we figure out how we take this phenomenal engine for the creation of wealth and we make sure that it's going to work better for everybody? That's the bad, but there's also the ugly. I'm going to unpack for you the event that led to the global financial crisis the collapse of Lehman Brothers Holding Company. 
There are so many other scandals, however, that I could unpack for you. Unfortunately, I could talk to you about the Volkswagen emission scandal. I could talk to you about the Barings Bank scandal. I could talk to you about Enron. I could talk to you about the LIBOR scandal. We could go on. Some of them are in the book. I'm happy to tell you that in the book, um, I don't go on too much about these. But I talk about them because we can't ignore them. So, if there's good and there's bad and there's ugly, what caused the ugly? What caused the ugly? I love this quote from Warren Buffett. He says that you only find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. <laughs> when Lehman Brothers collapsed, it turned out there was an awful lot of economic skinny dipping going on on Wall Street. Because the collapse took $13 trillion in net asset value off the markets of the world. We had very nearly double-digit unemployment and without question the worst recession since the Great Depression. But here's the thing. There are a lot of structural reasons why it happened. I mean, you know, we could, we could talk about all of the structural reasons and, and I'll mention some of them. Because remember that Lehman Brothers was the fourth largest company on Wall Street. It had $700 billion in assets under management. It reported 55 consecutive quarters of profit. It went out for a public offering in June of 2008, raised $6 billion, and within three months was bankrupt. That tells me there had to have been something more than just structural issues. There had to have been moral failure as well. There had to have been moral failure. You know, you know why I know that? Because I've been in the boardroom and I know how those decisions are made. Somebody had to make moral choices about what the bank was going to do leading up to that crisis. And those moral choices are really the problem. When I was a young man, my very first job uh, in business was actually on Wall Street. And, and then within a short period of time, I moved into the real economy and, and started working for manufacturing and building factories and things all over the world. But I, I was on Wall Street in the, uh, in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s. And this was a very well-known phrase. Bulls make money, bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. What we know from the collapse in 2008 is that the pigs took over. The pigs took over. And these were the structural failures. I won't go into it, but I, I, I unpack it in the book. The problem with um, the collateralized debt obligations and their, uh, their, their business model as, as a company, which had a gearing effect at one point of 40 to 1. And those of you who understand those things know how shocking that is. Uh, but there was also a lot of chicanery, a lot of sleight of hand. There was a thing called Repo 105, which, uh, again, it's technical. We don't have the time today to unpack it. I unpack it in the book. But basically, they would borrow money on the repurchase markets at the end of every quarter. And instead of reporting that transaction as an instrument of finance, there was a loophole in the regulations that said if there was 105% of the value of the loan to the equity, you could declare it as a sale, take those assets off your books, technically, so that when they reported to Wall Street what their debt exposure was, they were underestimating their debt exposure by the amount they borrowed in Repo 105. And then the very next day, it was back on their books. Technically, it was legal. But this is the problem. We live in a culture that confuses law with ethics. Law and ethics are not the same thing. Someone asked me at lunch yesterday, Ken, do they teach ethics at business school? I taught in Oxford University at the business school there, the side business school. And I said, until very recently, no. What they taught was compliance, not ethics. But you see, we defer to law and regulation when ethics fail, we need ethics, real ethics in business. 
So, these were the moral failures. There is something out there called the Volucus Report. The Volucus Report uh, is about 1,200 pages. I don't advise you download it and read it. But if you're a real geek about these things, the Volucus Report is the bankruptcy court's record of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. I have downloaded and read the Volucus Report. It'll keep you up at night. But here's what we find. Nobody at Lehman Brothers went to jail. In fact, nobody at Lehman Brothers was even charged with a crime. You know why? They didn't break the law. But what they did was grossly immoral. Their first sin was greed. Their first sin was greed. And here's why. If you look at the way the company was rewarding its executives you can understand why they wanted to manipulate the books in order to produce results that would give them more money in bonuses. The system was designed to entice people to think very, 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 very short term. And that's a problem. Short termism is one of the greatest problems we face in our entire economic system. Thank you. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, that's not the way the people who invented the concept of publicly traded shares viewed things. When a small group of people sat under an apple tree on Wall Street in New York 200 years ago to start what is now the New York Stock Exchange, the idea was to give the general public access to wealth creation by buying shares in companies and they would live or die by the success or failure of those companies. Most people bought and held stocks for a relatively long time. Now, fast forward to today, and we have a system where artificial intelligence and logarithms are making buy and trade decisions in nanoseconds. In nanoseconds. What's the result? A lot of temptation to manipulate the system. The other was hubris. I say hubris because this, you know, what does the Bible warn us of? Right? Pride goeth before fall. Hubris is when you think you're smarter than everybody else. And they all thought they were smarter than everybody else. Same was true of Enron. Any of you ever see the movie, Smartest Guys in the Room? Ever see that movie? If you haven't seen that movie, I recommend that movie. It's a movie about the collapse of Enron. And these guys just thought they were geniuses. Let me tell you something. I taught at Oxford University. I teach now at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. Before I walk into a classroom, I always tell myself, Ken, you're the dumbest guy in the room. You're the dumbest guy in the room. You just know your subject better than they do. And that's what they pay you for. But hubris is a moral issue. Because what you are doing is you are idolizing yourself. And hubris in business is very dangerous. There was a lack of prudence. There was a lack of any sense of whether or not it was fair what they were doing. They were gambling with other people's money. Now someone's wrote something uh, recently, it was, a, it was a review of my book, and they said, well, you know, Lehman Brothers, they were prop traders, so they were trading their own account. It wasn't agent accounts, so how can you say they were trading other people's money? Here's how. They're 40 to 1 gearing. And the fact that they were borrowing $200 billion on the repo market and went bust, that's gambling with other people's money. So they had no sense of the justice, and they had no courage to admit the fact that what they were doing is wrong, and they just, they just lacked temperance. It's all about excess. This is the big problem we have. Just generally speaking, right now, if you ask somebody, what's the purpose of business? They will say, to make money. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Bible teaches. And here's one of the great ironies. I still work as a consultant to companies. Because if you knew what Gordon Conwell paid me, you'd know why I have to still work. <laughs> When you speak to someone who's doing a startup, and some of you are small business people, I don't think I've ever met anyone whose, whose purpose for doing a startup was to make a lot of money. 
Do they want to be successful? Yes. Are they hoping that it'll you know, provide for their retirement, etc.? Yes. But almost inevitably, they'll say, I want to do something that's meaningful. I want to do something that's purposeful. I want to do something for my family and my kids and my grandchildren. I want to do something for the community. I've got a great idea. I think it's worth investing in. I'm willing to work 12 hours a day, five days a week, six days a week, do whatever is required to build the business. And if I, I end up becoming wealthy, praise God. If I don't, praise God. But I want to do something purposeful. That has been my experience. I don't know if that's been your experience. That's been my experience with people who are starting up companies. But what happens once they go public? And all of a sudden now, all that matters is the share price. And whether or not you get a buy recommendation from an analyst to give you the share price you're looking for. What happens to that? Virtue goes out the window. So this is the doctrine that started it all, in my opinion. September 13th, 1970, economist Milt Friedman Genius of a guy. And I'm not throwing the entire Friedman Doctrine of Economics or the Chicago School or the Austrian School under the bus here. I'm just talking about Friedman's Doctrine of Ethics. Here's what Milt Friedman said. He said, the only moral responsibility of a corporate executive is to make as much money as possible within the constraints of law and custom. And that has been the mantra in business schools and in boardrooms all over the world since he did that. Now, look, here's why it's a deeply flawed concept. It's deeply flawed because we know from Lehman Brothers you can obey the law and still do incredibly immoral things that are a danger, that are an existential threat to your business. So within the constraints of law doesn't mean anything. He also doesn't say anything about time. Make as much money as possible over what period of time? Tomorrow? Next month? The next conversation with the analysts? The next quarter? The annual report? Over what time? Because I can tell you and I'll share with you some stories where I know decisions were made that made money in the short run that were bad for the business in the long run. And custom? Custom? The custom of having a highly geared business model that pays executives exorbitant amounts of money based on short-term gain? It's a very, very flawed doctrine. So let me just tell you a story, though. Here's the interesting thing. When I started in business um, in my 20s, early 30s, I was punching way above my weight. And I was dealing with giants in business. And I hooked myself to their coattails in a lot of ways. Um, one day I got the opportunity to play golf with a very senior executive. And he was a lousy golfer and I was a scratch golfer. Now, you know how that changes the, the power structure right there, right? In business, he's up here. I'm this, you know, fledgling snot nose trying to work his way up the ladder guy. We get on the golf course, and I'm up here, and he's down here. So during the round, I'm giving him tips. I'm helping him, you know, do this, do that. When it was all over, he said to me, this was marvelous. I want you to join my club. I want you and your wife to come to my house and have dinner with my wife and I, I want to be a friend of yours. You know what? He was like the nicest guy. He was also the number two man at Lehman Brothers. You see, the people who make these decisions don't have horns. They're just like you and they're just like me. They're nice folks. They're folks we golf with, play tennis with, go to church with. They don't have horns. They're sucked into the vortex of money, 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 money. Make as much money as possible. I'll give you another example from my life. I was running a very large business responsible for all of Europe, Middle East, and Africa for my division, uh, 
the commercial operations of my division of a huge multi-billion dollar company. And it was an incredibly successful business. We were in basic materials. We had an 8.9% return on invested capital. Basic materials, are you kidding me? Unbelievable. And that was in local currency. I'm sorry, that was in US dollars. In local currency, it was double digit. One day, the vice chairman shows up unannounced, flies in on the corporate jet, calls a meeting of the European board, and says, you've got two months to take $15 million of fixed cost out of this business. I said, are you crazy? This business is ticking along beautifully. To get that kind of savings, I could lay off hundreds of people. Why would I lay off hundreds of people when the business is... He said, I don't care what you have to do. You're going to take $15 million of fixed cost out of this business. Do it. Got back on the plane, left. Now it's left to me. Well, good corporate soldier that I was. Sat down with the other directors. We worked out a plan. I start laying people off. One day, I sat face to face with a 54-year-old Frenchman who had been with the company 25 years, who through no fault of his own was now being told his services were no longer required. At 54, an executive of that level in France doesn't ever get another job. And I didn't have a good reason for why we were doing it. I went home and I said to my wife, this is soul destroying. I can't do this anymore. A couple of months later, I found out why we did it. Because when you have stock options and you're a senior executive, you have to file a form with the IRS saying, I'm exercising my stock options. This particular vice chairman had 2 million shares coming up. He had a strike date coming up. He had a strike price coming up. For every dollar the stock went up, he put $2 million in his pocket. Guess what? Stock went up two bucks. And by the way, I had stock options too. My hands aren't totally clean in this. I made money on that. But the problem is, the decision to do it was perverse. The reason was perverse. But technically it's legal. Technically he could say, hey, everybody won. The stock went up. All the shareholders are happy. But again, it was a short-term gain and done for the wrong reasons. Motive is always what matters. And what has happened in capitalism, what used to be called the Protestant ethic, where we believed in virtue in business, and it was the Protestant ethic that built capitalism in this country, has been replaced by ethical egoism. All that matters is what's in it for me. If it's good for me, it's good. And it's mainly because people misunderstand Adam Smith. Adam Smith, who is the man who codified capitalism in the 18th century, they take him out of context and they suggest that somehow Adam Smith was an ethical egoist. This is what they often quote. Every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He is in this and in many other cases led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worst for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So people read that and they go, ah, Adam Smith says, just look after your own interest and everything else will work out. It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is tinkering can have unintended consequences. So yes, you should look after your own interests, but never at the expense of others. And this is what has happened. We've taken the concept of self-love and turned self-love, which is a biblical concept, into selfishness. And if people really wanted to understand Adam Smith, they would have to read not just Wealth of Nations, but Moral Sentiments. Why? Because economics hasn't traditionally been a mathematical modeling science. Economics traditionally has been a moral science. Here's what Adam Smith said. The whole perfection and virtue of the human mind consists in its having some resemblance to, some share in, the perfections of God 
And therefore, in its being filled with the same drive of benevolence and love that influences all the actions of the deity, the only actions of men that were truly praiseworthy or could claim any merit in God's sight are ones that flowed from benevolence. It is only by actions of charity and love that we can suitably imitate the conduct of God. The people who like to quote the top verse never quote the bottom one. But the bottom one is the predicate for the top one. And that's why we need to redeem capitalism. Max Weber, who wrote a very famous book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Modern Capitalism, he understood that and he said, do you know why capitalism in America is capitalism on steroids compared to the rest of the world? It's because of this Protestant ethic. This kind of neo-puritanican view that you don't compartmentalize your life. It all belongs to God. Very famous Dutch theologian, Abraham Kuyper, famously said, there is not one square inch in all of creation over which Christ is sovereign that he does not proclaim mine. And Weber called this the this-worldly asceticism. And so... If you look at the great foundations, the charitable foundations of like the Carnegie and those things, they all came out of this. Why? Because they believe that hard work will produce wealth, but the purpose of wealth is not personal aggrandizement. The, pur the purpose of wealth is not conspicuous consumption. The purpose of wealth is to make society better, is to promote the common wheel, which is why, by the way, this is called the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is a common wheel. That was the whole idea behind the concept. That our government, our private sector, individuals in their homes, in their schools, in their communities, everybody sought to do their best, to be their best, so that all the boats rise with the tide. That's the concept. But... Max Weber was very prescient. Do you know why? Max Weber warned. He said, if America ever loses the ethic, they're going to create a form of capitalism which is very ugly. And that's what I call postmodern capitalism. Postmodern capitalism. This is my definition. It is devoid of a moral compass and resistant, if not impervious, to ethical constraint. And that is what we have. It is radically secular. It's built on mountains of debt. It reflects our society's lack of virtue and lack of values. It's focused more on the individual attainment than the common good. It's very, very short-term focus. It exploits the environment at times. It exploits wealth disparity, often demonizes the poor. It is a very ugly form of capitalism. And it breeds things like the global financial crisis. But remember what I said before? Capitalism is a subject, not an object. It's the result of countless choices. If we want capitalism with all of those wealth-generating benefits we talked about, but one that works for the common good, all we have to do is change our choices. So the question is how? Some people want to do a utopian version. In the book, I unpack Thomas Piketty. I unpack Bernie Sanders. Uh, I unpack... Uh, that fellow up on the right, he's the leader of the Labour Party uh, in, in the UK. I unpack the new Labour concept. I unpack the Occupy Wall Street. I have a whole chapter on Karl Marx. Here's the problem with utopian solutions. They are very attractive to young people. In fact, 19%, it's not a very big number, of millennials, according to a new Harvard study, self-identify as capitalists. 19%. Although they begrudgingly, 42% support our current economic system because they don't know if they have another choice. However, 58% say they would actually rather live in a socialist economy. Even though most of them don't know what socialism is. In fact, I would venture to guess if I went around the table and I asked people to define socialism, I'd get a lot of different answers. Here's what classic socialism is. 
It is the common ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. That's it. It is the common ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. That is socialism. So, it presumes that the pie is limited. It presumes, as Marx did, that it's a closed system. And it presumes that if there's public ownership, there will be egalitarian distribution. And it ultimately kills the very things that create wealth. So all of these different versions of utopia are a big problem. Because we know that it doesn't work. We've seen it in a million places not work. Now, that doesn't mean markets can do everything. I want to make that clear. There are limits to what the market can do. I'm very pragmatic about that. I hope you are too. There are limits. Sometimes the collective is more efficient than the market. And we should be grown up enough to understand those things and accept those things and promote those things. Why? Because in order for capitalism to work, the one thing you have to have is a natural equilibrium between supply and demand, and that's moderated by price. And sometimes there's no relationship between a person's need and their ability to pay. So in those circumstances, you go to the collective. National defense, classic example, infrastructure, I can give others. So if socialism isn't the answer, if Marxism isn't the answer, what are we going to do? And here's the answer, I hope. It's redemption. And I purposely use the term redemption because redemption, a theological term, means to overcome the effects of previous sins. Think about that. That's what redemption means. To overcome the effects of previous sins. Everything needs redemption. Not just capitalism. Everything needs redemption. And it's a very simple process to go through. First thing you do, you accept the fact that you're a sinner. You accept the fact that you're a problem. That you're part of the problem. You accept the fact that redemption is necessary. You fix what is fixable. You endure what is not. But most of all, Romans 12, 2, you become transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to start thinking differently about capitalism. And the good news is, there's a lot of biblical guidance here. A lot of biblical guidance. The Bible has more to say about faith, work, and economics than it does about heaven, hell, and sexual ethics combined. Okay? Let me repeat that. The Bible has more to say about faith, work, and economics than heaven, hell, and sexual ethics combined. I think the church has missed that point recently. And there's theological precedent. I was in Buddy's office yesterday, and right behind his desk, I, I noticed he has both volumes of Calvin's Institutes. Praise God, Buddy. You keep that up, boy. But frankly, there's theological precedent going right back to Augustine. The Bible as well, of course. But Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Kuiper, I could go on. And here's the good news. We have tools we can use to bring it about. And the first of these tools is common grace. In other words, even though we believe this is our mission as Christians to bring about the redemption of capitalism, it falls on the pericope of common grace. Even non-believers recognize that there's a problem. And the tools we want to use to bring it about, they have access to. It is not unique to the church. It is not unique to Christianity. It is not unique to faith systems. Common grace, God's benevolence for all of us, opens up the door for us to use wisdom as a tool. Wisdom. In Proverbs, there's a great definition of wisdom. And in the book of James, we have the seven pillars of wisdom. Purity, peacefulness, gentleness, reasonableness, mercy, humility, sincerity. And in the Hebrew, it's the word chokhmah. And I say that because biblical wisdom is not the same as Greek wisdom. Greek wisdom, three words, techne, phronesis, 
Sophia. It's either highly utilitarian or highly philosophical. The two don't ever meet. In the Hebrew word chokmah, you have observation and participation always together. So if you see something that needs fixing, you fix it. So here's what I want you to do at your tables. I want you to think about some of the things we've talked about. And I want you together to read Proverbs 9, 1 to 6 plus 10a. And, I, and someone do it out loud at the table. And then someone else read James 3, 17. And ask yourself these questions. How can wisdom and the pillars of wisdom be practically applied to issues like wages and other human resource issues? Supply chain relations, customer relations, shareholder relations, product development, general business uh, uh, decision making, business planning, environmental. You pick which ones you want to talk about. We won't get to all of them. But I want you to start thinking about how you can take the theoretical what the Bible is teaching us with the actual, with the applicable, what we know about business that needs redemption. And among yourselves, talk about some of these things. How can these concepts that are in those Bible passages be practically applied in your own business setting or in other business settings? Everyone understand the assignment? Get to it. Thank you all. We'll come back in about... 25 minutes.